Welcome to the Profitable Farmer Podcast, where it's all about increasing the profitability of your farm by working smarter, not harder. G'day once again to Profitable Farmer, Jeremy Hutchings here. Um, as coronavirus unfolds and we see that impacting the wool industry certainly, but perhaps other industries outside agriculture, I think it's fair to say that we are a lucky industry on the whole and certainly cattle and sheep meat um, and other proteins, I think we can be pretty confident um, in the short term to medium term that um, those markets and those enterprises are going to be strong for us. I'm really delighted today to introduce Tom Bull to you all. Tom owns with his family Lampro in Holbrook. Um, Tom, I was uh, thinking about you just the other day and it occurred to me that you must have celebrated probably your 30 or even your 35th anniversary as a sheep genetics and stud specialist. Is that fair? How many years has Lampro been in existence? Uh, yeah, you're probably right. We're probably uh, getting close to 30 years. So I sort of started breeding sheep when I was eight. Um, and yeah, basically, I think I've increased my numbers consecutively every year since then. So yeah, when people, when you tell people, I think we had a 25th sale dinner last year and people go, yeah, yeah, I haven't been breeding rams 25 years. I said, well, we actually have. So yeah, yeah been a while. How do you celebrate your 30th or 35th year, mate? Do you get a tie or something? Uh, yeah, no, we just uh, roll up and do it again. Um, oh. We enjoy we enjoy doing it more than more than anything. So, yeah, I don't really get too sentimental about that sort of stuff. Um, yeah, just get on and do it again next year. I really appreciate you joining us, Tom. And I think it's fair to say, um, and many people will know Tom in the sheep meat sector um, as a genuine authority and um, a real driver of um, efficiency and performance for so many of his clients across Australia. So great having you online, Tom. Thank you. Thank you. I distinctly remember growing up with Tom, um, 16, driving in the Subaru Brumby, belting out ACDC up and down the main street of Marimbula on summer holidays. And Tom, I don't know about you, but those um, games of touch footy on the beach with the Baldwins and the Triggs and the Chadwicks and the others, they seemed to go all day, didn't they? They did. No reason we, we should we keep doing it. Yeah, we have an age touch, so... That's yeah. it. We can only keep next, trying. Next generation coming along now, doing the same thing. One of my goals is to be 70 and still able to participate in those. So looking forward to the next generation rolling through. So, Tom, yeah, exactly. on that, mate, um, when I was at the beach age 12... I had nothing to think about on the weekends or like, like my life was like most 12 year olds. But what interests me is that when you were eight, you started your white Suffolk stud. And when you were 12 and 13 and perhaps heading off to boarding school, um, you were running, a, you know, an emerging white Suffolk stud from that young age. Can you just tell us how you got into that and how that played out perhaps through your early teenage years? Yeah, well, I think, funny enough, Dad was more into cattle. Um, and, you know, most of our enterprise for a number of years has been cattle. And, and there was a few merino weathers from time to time. But for some reason, I, I love the lamb industry. I love lambs. Um, it wasn't clean cut. So how I actually got into it was when Dad was shearing his weathers, I actually found a few merino ewes in with the weathers and, um, yeah, convinced him to buy a meat ram when I was about eight. Um, out of the first shearing of 6,000 weathers, I think we we uh, we found about 25 merino ewes. Um, within three years, I was up to 150 ewes, and Dad said, oh, you've got to cut them down to five. Um, you're getting too many sheep around the place. So I decided at the time, stud, if I've got to have five ewes, I'm going to make them stud. Um, and that's exactly what I did. Brian Ward from Walmargama Station got me, um, started off with a few Suffolk ewes, and, um, and really... From then on, um, we expanded different breeds. Um, you know, I remember working at university, I was working two jobs, not only just to fund my weekend activities, but I was actually saving money and buying stud ewes as I went. So, you know, by the time I finished university, I had a couple hundred stud ewes, um, which, uh, 
yeah, which I really enjoyed and still do to this time. Such a credit to you, mate. Um, at your 40th a few years ago, um, your wonderful wife, Phoebe, read out some letters that you used to send back. I think you used to send letters or faxes quite regularly back to your father, um, Rick and Trish, um, giving them instructions on stock movements and um, nutrition requirements, etc. Is that correct? Were you running your Yeah, no, there's... Enterprise my mum still got those letters and... You know, there was no interest in their social welfare. It was basically how the year's going, who's lambed, who hasn't lambed. Um, it was back in the days where there wasn't, you know, there wasn't a lot of phones at boarding school, but yeah, most letters were very detailed instructions on what to do, um, when to mark the lambs and whatnot. And mum and dad still laugh about that. Um, they've still got all the letters there, um, yeah, from, from all those years ago. It's an amazing story, mate. Um, so fast forward 30 years. How do you describe your business today, Tom, um, and perhaps even relative to those early years? Uh, our business now, um, we've got 4,000 acres here um, at Holbrook. Um, we run 6,500 sea stock ewes, selling this year we'll put 3,000 3, rams on the market. Annually, our rams in Australia sire close to 900,000 lambs. Um, we've also got a research business, the Prime Lamb Improvement Company, which basically funds activities to go into Lampro. And as well as the last two years, we've started Kinross Station, Hampshire Down, um, which is a premium lamb business, which is just taking off as we speak. So it's certainly increased in size. Um, we have three full-time staff. Um, and really, it's doing exactly the same thing. It's just a little bit, it's just a little bit um, bigger than what it used to be. But I often say it's actually easier now than when I was twenty, because I couldn't afford all the gear and the technology back then. Um, yeah, so yeah, the business is certainly evolving, and and I hope it keeps evolving. And Tom, clients across Australia are you supplying rams into most states at the current time? Yeah, we, except for Western Australia and the Territory, we sell rams into Tassie, Western Vic, um, or all of Victoria, South Australia. Um, we have sold sheep to Queensland, but it's really not a big market. But yeah, the big four, sort of Tassie, New South Wales, Vic and SA. Um, great to have a geographic spread in our, in our business. It's always been a really important part because what it does is diversifies our seasonal risk. If you sell all your rams in one postcode, if they have a drought, your sales dry up. Where we try and spread our rams in as many geographical areas as we can. Um, it also helps our clients when selling surplus ewes because if we've got clients in Tasmania, and for example, New South Wales was tough the last two years, we certainly had a lot of demand from Victoria, South Australia and Tasmania to take surplus ewes from dry states. Thanks, Tom. So if you reflect back on, I guess, the amount of research that you've done and the advancements that you've made, what are some of the, the key milestones that you're most proud of, perhaps in your core line first, and then we might talk about the Kinross product second, but what are some of the, what are some of the milestone advancements that you see your um, business making over time? I think the key thing is we were, we were involved when land plan started back in 1994, the first cross block run, um, we have been a driver of performance recording. And back in 1994, um, the use of data in the selection of sheep was a four letter word. Um, you know, you show sheep, the judge um, or the sheep class to tell you which one's good. And, uh, and certainly that's probably, you know, one of our legacies, we have been at the forefront of that now for a number of years. Um, I think the other thing is dispelling the need to have pure breeds. Um, you know, we were one of the first mainstream composite operations in Australia. Um, and really, once we sort of took that approach of data and profitability over purity and of subjectivity has probably been the two key drivers, you know, over sort of 25 years. Um, and that hasn't changed. The only difference is now their mainstream, you know, there's a lot of composite studs now started and there's a lot of people, even, you know, Merino people now are using, um, you know, objective measurement. 
when you talk about data and and the the detailed performance recording what are what are some of the things that you record just as an insight because i know you go into incredible depth with this what what what, well, we, what is some of the we, data detail that you capture so 8,000 lambs this year will probably have 20 data points on each lamb. So you know, our business will collect 160,000 bits of data. And really the core of seed stock is putting sheep in a commercial environment um, and collecting a lot of data. So that starts um, you know, birth weighing, looking at mothering ability, um, you know, weighing the lamb. You know, then as time goes by, at lamb marking, we now genomic test lambs, you know, new technology. So we'll actually get a snapshot of their genes through taking um, a little hole punch in their ear, uh, you know, and that's right through to muscle, um, fat, growth rate. You know, there's a whole range of data, but it is really our, our business is data collection. Once we collect data, you know, the idea is every year we find animals are more profitable and, and we've done that consecutively for 25 years, you know, we never dreamed we'd be able to breed the rams we do today, 25 years ago. Remembering when I started, it was actually very difficult to produce an 18 kilo lamb year round. Um, and their lamb issue was so much different back then. The genetics, feedlotting didn't occur because the cost benefits, you know, lamb was two dollars a kilo carcass weight. Growing wasn't that much different. And, you know, you just, the economics didn't work. But as the genetics changed, the market expanded. Um, all of a sudden, all these this data collection and genetic gain has actually enabled the industry to do great things. Um, you know, it was a one billion dollar industry when I started. I think I heard the other day it's a six billion dollar industry, and there's no reason it won't go to a ten in the next sort of five to ten years. What um, what um, selection? Or what what focus do you have now that's underpinning your selection? I guess at the present time. Well, I think. We've got maternal sheep and terminal sheep, and all our we've got four different breeding programs, and they've all got job descriptions. You know, our maternal sheep needs to be able to run at high stocking rates, um, basically max minimise cost, maximise output. You know, that's that's a key theme. So really, for that, that's basically having two big lambs, doing it off grass, getting those lambs to a market um, on cheap grass, not expensive grain, and then really. Um, you know, being able to shut down. So our terminals, you know, we've got a tradie and a dorset, really that's a high production, high muscled animal. But probably more recently, we've actually launched the Hampshire Down, which is really a niche product for high-end markets. So, you know, depending on the program, so for example, our Hampshire Down, you know, we probably won't have the growth rate as some of the dorsets, but the carcass value significantly more. So um, yeah, it's basically horses for courses. But it all does come down to one word, and that's profitability. And I think we spend a lot of time, a lot of research is understanding profit. And that's the really profit and production. Um, the, the link between profit and production in the lamb industry is poorly understood. A lot of people get very confused that a, high product, a highly productive flock mightn't be that profitable. And that's getting that balance. And really what the, the problem I see with lamb is people, produ production seductive. So people feed and feed and, and have this huge cost structure um, where often a lot of our most profitable lamb producers are just simple low, low input systems. Um, yeah, so when we have to look at our business, it's basically, I always say focus on the system and then find the sheet that suits the system rather than trying to, breed a profitable sheep, breed a profitable system. So Tom, if you think about a couple of your most profitable clients, yep. can you just expand on that a bit? How, how do their enterprises look and, and perhaps the cost structures and the system and the business model that supports that um, enterprise? Can you give well, us a, a snapshot there? The first thing is labour efficiency. You know, labour efficiency is king. So, you know, the, being able to run 5,000 use to 6,000 use per labour unit is, it shouldn't be that hard. Um, and if it is hard, I often challenge people's infrastructure. You know, if you need three people to run 6,000 use, you've got poor infrastructure. Um, so I think that's probably the key thing. The second thing is understanding 
you know, levels of nutrition, you know, and stocking rate to match that system. Um, you know, there's no doubt high stocking rates create complexity, but, you know, for us, it's actually breeding sheep that can handle a high stocking rate and still being able to produce. Um, the third thing is, I think, is really understanding that those cost benefits of nutrition. You know, it's really simple to get high lambing percentages. It's just a cost. You know, lots of feed will equal lots of lambs, but it's working out where's that line between profitability and um, working out you know, the nutrition um, versus the output. And that's what our, probably our really good clients get that right, is uh, understanding that cost structure and where it should be. And it's often not maximum. You know, often, you know, and I heard a New Zealand consultant once say that, you know, optimum lamb production is probably about 80% of potential. And I'd probably don't disagree. Yeah, it's a really interesting point because if, if we think about the cropping sector, there's plenty of people chasing maximum yield um, and high input farming. And, and that is sort of now proving not to, to probably create more risk in their system um, and not be the most um, efficient profit machine long term. I guess what you're suggesting is that's similar in the meat game. Yeah, it certainly is. I mean, there's no doubt you keep putting your rear on crops, you'll get high yields, but there's a tipping point. Um, and sheep's no different. It's just getting that optimum um, between input and outputs. And the, the worst thing I see in the industry, there's so much information about production, 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 you know, trying to get 200% scanning and 160, 170% lambs. And it sounds really good, you know, it sounds really good at the pub, but the reality is, you know, our most profitable clients are probably operating around 140% mm. because that's, that's probably the, you know, the right ratio um, between cost and output. Tom, a lot of um, movement towards confinement lots and on-farm feedlots. Are you seeing that as a positive and are you seeing people do that really well? Yeah, that's, I think it's really exciting, particularly where we see there's two opportunities. You know, we need... You know, the old benchmark was a U per hectare per 100 mils of rainfall was a, a, a good target for a lamb flock. We've, we've actually seen clients being able to go up significantly more. And there's a couple of things we're trying to do is actually evolve the sheep for the system with the, with the drought lots. The first thing is what we want to do is actually get sheep that eat the spring and put it on its back in the form of condition. The second thing is we actually want to breed sheep that can survive on low quality feed in those drought lots. So we only feed our sheep straw in drought lots. And it, for us, it's an evolutionary process to try and have a sheep that can actually operate at low cost. But it's been a massive, some of the stocking rates in 650 mil rainfalls, you know, we've got clients up at 10 years a hectare. And the core reason is because they're being able to take the ewes out of the system um, when, you know, in the autumn period and not, and not let the pastures be degraded. So I think, you know, one of the biggest innovations of the last two to three years is that. Um, feedlotting, you know, it's been going and, and it's, it's escalating now. The amount of new feedlots built in New South Wales is scary. And I think it'll sort the, the wheat from the chaff for the next two years because there's not going to be a lot of store lambs around, you know, relative to available grain. Um, so, you know, whilst there's a lot of feedlots, doesn't mean they're all going to be profitable. And I, we always tell our clients, you know, you've got to sell your lambs into the feedlot. You know, it is another enterprise. So um, I think there's certainly uh, a lot of opportunities. It's not rocket science, lamb feedlotting. You know, there's really good resources, really good systems to make it easy. And that's a double-edged sword because that means everyone can do it. So, yeah, there's no doubt there been, there's been some real upside to this try. And we saw it in 2006 where the systems changed. You know, when all of a sudden people learn how to feed sheep. And we've seen it again in New South Wales, people are really good at feeding sheep. And that, that's a great thing. But I certainly reckon that confinement feeding will allow us to really ratchet up those lambs per hectare, you know, in sort of six, 700 mil rainfalls above 12 lambs a hectare, which is exciting stuff. Mm. And it's hard to beat those rates of return. Thanks, Tom. So taking a bit of a bigger picture view, um, what's your sort of view of the broader meat market at the moment um, and what's your outlook for sheep meat in the medium term? Well, I suppose I, I look at, if I wind back to December, to my views from say the 1st of December to my views the 1st of May, they've probably changed slightly. 
mm-hmm. um, you know, we are, we are not going to be a low cost producer. Um, lamb is on most menus in the world is bracketed with lobster. And that's a double edged sword. We saw it in September 11. I can remember September 11 really clearly in my mind back in 2001 when I was driving to a meeting at a meat company in Melbourne and literally as a plane were hitting the building, I was on the way and, and I rang just to say I'm going to be a little bit late and they said, yeah, don't worry because all they were getting is phone calls from around the world to cancel container loads. You know, and that's, that's one of the problems of being a niche, you know, a high-end niche. You are very vulnerable to global shockwaves um, and you're also very vulnerable you know as, as COVID but the fundamental is people have to eat all we've seen is a transformation from food service back to retail um, what is the next two years look like I think that's really a question of what's the economy going to look like you know are we going to ride through this and, and you know you can read one article that says we're going to bounce back really quickly the other one says it's going to be worse than 1930 um, so that's a million dollar question um, lamb is an expensive product um, and I think really our positioning of the product worldwide has got to be premium niche um, to survive but there's just going to be a few hiccups I do think it will return to previous levels it's just what time frame on the farm Tom with wool prices where they are do you think that people are going to entertain a continued shift perhaps away from wool towards meat or do you think that the balance is about where it, where it will be? I think there's no doubt. Um, the wool market with an 85% reliance on China um, is going to scare a lot of people and it already is. I mean we're seeing huge passing rates. Um, the exposure to one market is not healthy and I think we're seeing more and more and we see it from our phone calls. You know we get you know, when we see an enterprise swings on, we'll, we'll see it in the phone. And, and there's no two ways we'll, we'll see an increase in the number of meat rams going over Merino use this year. Um, and as, as a genetic a breeding program, we make a lot of decisions. Um, and those decisions in genetic terms, you know, really take 10 years to change. We've always stuck to our meat focus. We've never gone down that wool focus. And and that's a double-edged sword. You know, at times when wool prices are high, you think, oh, have I made the right decision? But, you know, we are very confident about the, the outlook relative to other enterprises of, of, of meat and high-quality lamb. So nothing's changed. Will it come back? Yes, it will. Do I think we'll still be operating in the top 10% of percentiles over the last five years? I think we will be. So we can't complain too much. Thanks, Tom. So... Um, coming back to, I guess, your business, you mentioned that you now employ three people. Um, practically, um, how do you go about um, working cohesively as a family unit and um, what sort of practices do you employ in terms of um, managing and leading that team? Um, I've probably taken more of a hands-off approach now. Um, we have got a, you know, a very good manager um, who deals with a lot of the day-to-day stuff. So I think, and with your help, Hutch, over the years, is working out how you can remove yourself from the business. So I set the big picture. Like I'm a, you know, whilst the guilt kills me at times, I like doing the big picture stuff, getting the business in the right direction and let Rosie manage a team of people to get all the operational stuff done. So I suppose without handballing it, you know, really my role is linking with Rosie and also, you know, yeah, the, the rest of the team. But also, I think it goes back to finding the right team members. You know, we love people that are hungry. We love, you know, we've got a very young staff, um, you know, and they're hungry and they're, they're bright. Um, and I think, you know, that makes it very easy. If you've got a shared passion, if people want to be at work, um, it makes a big difference. I can't handle people who don't want to be here. Um, they're the wrong people. They need to go. So it just starts off with having a team. We're 50% female. Um, you know, Rosie and Georgia run rings around, you know, Dad and Duck and I for attention to detail. You know, they are brilliant because they're university educated people um, who get the importance of data. So, yeah, I think that's probably the big change in our business is stepping back from the operational day to day 
and um, and getting the big picture stuff aligned. And since we've done that, our business has doubled in turnover. Yeah, it's a really, really interesting point, mate. I mean, you are very strategic, very commercial. I think that's come with with years of practice. Um, how hard was it to make that transition away from being an operator and very much hands-on, which I know you were, to, to being um, more in that true CEO-style role? Yeah, well, I think it's really, uh, there's just a guilt factor. You know, on a cold, windy day when everyone's out tagging lambs with a sleet hitting their face, even though you might go to town and get them a coffee and hot chocolate, you know, you know, it still makes you feel guilty and you've got to be comfortable with that. But I think the key thing of our business, if you look at C-Stock, it's really looking at emerging trends and looking, and really when I see our business has succeeded because before in, in front of every emerging trend, we've been there before everyone else has got there. When the composite thing we thought was going to happen, the reason we thought it was going to happen, the merino industry wasn't generating enough replacements, um, you know, to support the lamb industry. Um, you look at some of the breeds and whatnot. You look at the premium lamb, you know, the Wagyu industry is a billion dollar industry. The, the Angus industry, the brand Angus industry is probably a $3 billion industry. So things like that is being able to position yourself where likely change is going to occur. I, I've done a lot better by backing out of the business. When you're not thinking about, you know, will that set of triplets survive in paddock number 46? You yep. know, you're thinking, well, you know, how do we get a leg up? How do we all of a sudden we get in Harrods? You know, how do we get the big picture stuff right? And that's been transformational, being able to do that. But it comes with a mental, wank, you know, anxiety that you, you don't feel like you're uh, doing, you know, as much work. But, you know, I'm comfortable with that now after you know, probably five years of operating like that. So two questions, mate. Firstly, what advice would you have for people? What would you say to people who are genuinely in that transition and, and wrestling with that guilt of being indoors and thinking critically about the future relative to being in the paddock and on the tools? What would you say to them? Oh, I think you've got to have a balance. You know, I still... The key... What, the other key thing, I know every ram. So... I think we use 75 seed stock rams this year, um, probably close to an 80. I know the pedigree of every one. And one, one thing in my business, I've said, I'm not going to lose that because that's what's got us to where we have been is knowing every sheep, knowing its strengths, knowing its weaknesses. So it's probably getting that balance for me yep. of getting a few components of the hands-on that you keep involved with, but also then making sure, you know, you're getting the big picture stuff right. Um, and I think that's, um, it just takes a bit of juggling, but it's also getting the right staff. If you've got the right staff below you, that process is really easy. Yeah, yeah. So it's working out how you attract those staff. You know, are you a, an attractive business to come for? And the thing about our business, we would get a resume every two weeks now because um, people want to work for us. And that's great. A lot of, and one of the key things of doing that I probably speak in front of 250 university students a year. You know, we have university tours, we have, you know, ICMJ presentations. So, you know, we spend a lot of time speaking to youth and trying to inspire youth. And that, that has an impact because all of a sudden those people leave university and, you know, you get a CV. So, you know, I think that transition um, become an attractive business to work for, you know, younger generations, they love pushing the envelope. And I've, I say to our staff, we want to be at the front. You know, we've always been at the front. We're not going to lose it, you know. People are going to come in and work out how they can keep us at the front. Um, and if you do that and get that culture, it smells. And when you've got a good culture, people can sense it. They want to work for you. When people want to work for you, you get the right people and it makes everything easier. Yeah, it's a great point, Tom. What, what really interests me is that you've, over time, evolved, evolved to a place where every one of your employees is university graduated and you're attracting those high-caliber people. You know, surround yourself in, in really good people and then kind of get out of their way seems to be a bit of the theme that you're talking about. I talk about that law of vacuum, whereas when you step up into a more senior role for yourself, you create this void that yeah. good people will step up into. Um, and I think, you know, to your point, I think you've seen that over time, which is a real credit to you. How do you, how do you enrol them um, in the decision-making? Do you have a, an in-depth annual planning day? Do you have... Yeah, we do. We have an annual... 
planning day, and, I, and you've been involved in the past, Hutch, you know, and that's really about putting a document together, which is about our strategic goal. Um, funny enough, we haven't done that just yet for the year, but that's in the next few weeks. Um, in mid-June, mid we'll do that. And that's really about having ownership of, of our plan and every, everyone's input. And that can be a menial thing like an OH&S thing that's bugging people. You know, might be an auger that isn't safe right through to the big picture stuff. Get everyone buy-in. Um, and that's a really important part that everyone knows why we do stuff. You know, why don't we, you know, maternal lambs, for example, we don't baby them. We don't, you know, if all of a sudden we let evolution take its place, people got to understand the, commer the commercial reasons of why we do what we do. And it makes the job easier when you're genomic testing. Um, you know, when all of a sudden, you know, that bit of data has got to be accurate. If people understand why the whys, it makes, um, it just makes that job a lot easier. Yeah. Thank you, mate. Um, so when you look at the emerging trends and, you know, the lo longer term, where is your focus and, and what are your priorities or where do you see the opportunities being, Tom, out three and five years? Uh, there's no doubt we see this premium lamb business as a massive opportunity. Um, currently, if you've got the Queen coming for dinner, there isn't any real brands that give you any point of difference. Um, really, a lot of the meat lamb brands are all based on the same pool of genetics, um, offer, you know, a whole range of nutritional systems. So being able to nail what we call a five-star eating experience has been a big focus. The opportunities for that is significant. You know, we've even after COVID, you know, last week, all, all the, you know, the businesses we were ready to go into 2020 have all said, no, we're back on board for 2021, you know, in China, Middle East. So for our clients, you know, the beauty about scale, you know, there's one thing to have a brand and go to farmers markets. There's the other, there's the other thing with our client base, you know, with potentially having a million lambs born next year to be able to create scale for brands. Um, and have critical mass to be able to do stuff. So I, I see our clients in the, the next three years, we've actually outlined a plan for our clients. The next three years are all about breeding use. We see a, a fundamental lack of breeding use in the system. So we see our clients focusing on breeding lots of use at high value, um, probably you know, 2020, 2021 to really get the numbers pumped up. And we think they'll do extremely well. As numbers stabilise, we then see our client base really then looking at the high-end market. Um, we see, going back to feedlots, we see segmentation occurring like in beef, you know, being people who sell 40 kilo lambs into a feedlot who will then feed them for specialist markets. So, you know, I suppose I see the, the short term for our client um, versus the medium to long is different. Um, and I think the big lesson for us, we've got to be nimble. You know, we've got to be able to move quick. Um, you know, COVID's hit us, bushfires has hit us. You know, there's, there's, things, there's things that will impact that business model. But I think the core principle, if you've got a simple low cost breeding enterprise, um, you can handle those shocks. Um, and we've always said with the, some of this high end stuff, we don't want to go down the Wagyu model, which is a higher cost system. So really with our Hampy program, it's about trying to produce high quality lamb at low cost. So, you know, our cost structures remain intact. So um, domestic versus export, what's the interplay there, do you think, long term? I think uh, there's no doubt export's going to play a big role. Um, there's a lot of six-star restaurants in the world. Mm. Um, so I do think it's going to be a mixture, and I think it's wise to be a mixture. Um, we've got some good domestic partners um, we're working with, but, you know, really what's happened with food service and COVID you know, a lot of it's gone on the back burner till 2021. And that, that doesn't worry us too much, I'll be honest, because we've got a lot of work with our feedlotting to do. Um, you know, we've just, we've just started an indoor feedlot here at Kinross, and there's a lot of bugs to line out before we fire it up. So, um, yeah, there's no doubt it'll be a mixture of both. And remembering one lamb goes to different places. You know, my favourite cut um, in the lamb is the forequarter. Japanese style. There's one thing I learned at the World Cup last year was how to eat lamb. There you, you know, go. Doing it thinly sliced on those Japanese barbecue, you can't beat it. 
you know, the same lamb that's lamb forecourt will go to a teppanyaki restaurant in, in Tokyo, its rack might go to Dubai. You know, we last year we had lamb eating the tallest building in the world, you know, and the restaurant at the top. You know, so I think it'd be a mixture, you know, the legs might go on the domestic market. So um, yeah, I think probably I think probably the biggest probably the best thing I've heard from MLA in the last couple of years, I think we've probably got to take down our attitude of domestic versus export. Because what is interesting enough, and Lisa Sharp, when she was at MLA, made a really good point one of our field days. There's more similarity between the top end demographic between all, you know, China, US, Middle East and Australia than what is between them and the rest of the rest of the society. So lamb is a premium product that's going to be eaten by people between 30 and 55, young professionals. That's the demographic. Now, that doesn't matter when they live in Sydney, Tokyo, Beijing, that is our market. So when we build it back, what does that market want? That market wants brands, you know, and that's one thing Lamb lacks. They lack brands that have got not only, you know, guaranteed eating quality, but they've also got environmental, you know, credentials as well. And the thing I love about the meat industry and the thing I love about Wagyu, and it absolutely fascinates me. People, a lot of people don't eat Wagyu because they enjoy the taste. They eat Wagyu because it's what it says about them. It's no different when my wife goes to a paddock barbecue, she might take a bottle of Maui, for example. And I'm sure she doesn't know the difference between the taste of the generic champagne, but it's all about status symbol. So it's interesting all of a sudden where we see lamb and Wagyu, and don't get me wrong, Wagyu's taken a big hit during COVID, but it becomes an, it comes an emotional decision. Mm. It's no different to people buying a Tesla car who don't really care about the environment. They just want to look like they care about the environment. So I think there's some really complex and exciting things that are going to happen in land. But remembering the key thing is young professionals, 35 to 55 are our customer. You know, the, the sad reality of price increases is Betty Blackdown can't afford to buy lamb three times a week. And that changes, you know, because all of a sudden, and you speak to a Sydney cab driver who has a disposable income for food for $180. And I, I did it, you know, back in at Christmas time. And, I, and you say, you work out, if they've got $180 for the week, but he's got a family of five teenagers. You know, you can't afford to blow $60 out on a lamb roast. Mm. So I think we've got to be comfortable that we've fallen out of the weekly repertoire, but there's been a really good uptake, you know, within that high-end market. We've just got to work out how we position the product and the production systems to target that. It's not about what we buy. It's about how what we buy makes us feel. And I think you're exactly right that people want to drive Mercedes and BMWs and Audis where they could be buying cars at half the price it's exactly the same principle just with that in mind and perhaps in starting to wrap up tom your hampshire down product that you've pioneered and um i think there are some traits around that that i'd like for you to explain um that do link back to eating quality and um, marbling um which are pioneering in the media the lamb industry um can you just tell us about how you've um arrived to being able to launch that product and um you know how you're positioning that in the marketplace so really in 2012, you know, all the things I've just said was very evident back then. So really what we want to do is look for point of difference in the marketplace for marbling. So with, with the help of MLA, we actually started a project where we actually consumer tasted a whole range of genetics, you know, South Down, Dorsets, Maternal Composites. Um, and we actually included Hampshire down on a hunch. Um, one of the big things is what we realised, there were some really good Hampshire Downs and there were some absolute rubbish Hampshire Downs, but the top end consumers, you know, their willingness to pay data was almost double what the average Dorset was. So once we saw that there was an opportunity within those genetics, we actually went and purchased a big whack of all our Hampshire Down sheep that we believed had that marbling propensity. So really in the last four years, it's then about taking those genetics forward and finding those outliers. And, and out of that, it all comes back to willingness to pay. So if we can get an animal eating 87 MSA rating, which is out of 100, you know, on a loin, 
they will pay twice as much for an MSA five versus an MSA three. You know, that on a lamb on two kilos of loin can be $50 a carcass. So in Japan, it's actually nearly three times. So the Japanese market will pay three times more for a marble score five than a three. So really our program has been about objectively understanding consumer satisfaction and then putting that into a breeding program. And, and the Kinross Station program is all about literally operating with the highest marbling potential that exists, not only, not only in Australia, but the world. And, um, and then really then looking for different nutritional strategies to try and enhance that consumer experience. For the, a lot of us might not have tried that. Um, what's the eating quality like? Um, high marbling versus what we're used to? It's just juiciness and tenderness. You know, there's, it just, it's a lot juicier, you know, as marble, the average lamb in Australia is 4.2% marbling. So New Zealand, believe it or not, it's only about one and a half. Europe's about 2%. So we've done some really good things in Australia. We're at 4.2. You all of a sudden triple that to 12%. Picture a lamb that's three times as juicy. And there's a big genetic link between juiciness and tenderness. So as you increase the juiciness, it becomes more tender as well. So, um, yeah, it's exciting times. And I think, you know, remembering that's only a small part of our business, you know, Kinross Stations is less than 10% of our business. Um, but really, we see it becoming probably a bigger part of our business in five years. And it comes down to, by stepping back and looking for the opportunities, um, we came up with this and we've put the pieces in, in place to really try and position our business and more importantly, our clients' business for 2025. Tom, um, just one other question on that. You mentioned briefly the environmental story and the link back to perhaps um, sustainable environmental and ethical um, issues around production. That high-end 30 to 50-year-old global consumer how important is that um, in the story that wrapped around the product? Um, I think probably the key thing is, is not only the, uh, probably the best, thing to, best way to explain is the way David Hughes explains, um, sorry, my wife just getting her yoga gear. Uh, the, the average consumer has two brains. They have a during the week brain and they have a weekend brain. It's a really interesting thing to understand. And Professor David Hughes, at one of our things, went through it a few years ago. During the week, people in their mind accumulate credit points by eating healthy and doing exercise. So on Monday, you know, you might have no meat. Um, Tuesday, Wednesday, you eat, you know, very lean and green. But come Friday, you know, it's not vegetables. It's, you know, high end. It's beer, you know, all the things you don't do during the week. And I think it's really important for us to understand, you know, where we sit in that, in that picture. We're a weekend product. We are luxurious. Um, and I think that's where the during the week brain is certainly more tied in with the green message. You know, on Monday, you probably want to save the planet. On Friday, you just want to have a six pack and, you know, enjoy a bloody good steak. So I think it's understanding where that, where your product sits. And, and certainly, uh, green's important. I, I just think it's a given. You know, we've got to become carbon neutral by 2030. You know, what does that look like for us? That's 10% of our place planted to trees, um, in a nutshell. So, you know, we've got 10 years to do it. And really, for us, we hope to do it quicker. But it's just having that plan and having that back, back end of, you know, environmental sustainability intact. Thanks, Tom. So, um... To everyone listening, thank you very much for your time. If you're interested to understand more about LAMPRO, um, Tom and Phoebe and the LAMPRO website is lampro.com.au. Um, as you mentioned, Tom, you've got some 3,000 rams to sell in November this year. So, guys, if you are interested in what Tom's covered, um, and interested in either making a shift or you know, enhancing your strategy around meat production and sheep meat production, jump onto that website. I'm sure Tom's only too happy to, to check in and, and speak with you further. 
Tom, thank you very much for your time. Um, it has been an amazing 35 year-ish journey and story. Um, the impact that I think Lampro and your leadership has had on the Australian sheep meat sector is, um, is really significant and will continue to be. Um, so congratulations on that. And um, just fascinating to hear your take on um, the industry, the marketplace, and I guess consumer trends and how best to meet those in the medium to long term. So thank you for your time. Thanks, Hutch. Thanks for all your help um, over the years. And uh, yeah, it's fantastic watching uh, what you're doing with this new venture. Thanks, Tom. Much appreciated. Um, ladies and gents, that's lampro.com.au and um, just reach out with any other questions. Um, have a great week and we'll look forward to checking in again with you shortly. Take care and bye for now.